Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I'm going to start a brand new series talking about the power of imagination. I've ministered on this a few times, but I think it was back in 2019, I think is the last time I did this on my television program. And this is one of the most important things that the Lord has ever spoken to me. Of course, that's hard to say because everything that God speaks to you is important. But as far as making a difference in my life and ministry and the things that were happening, this was just a game changer. It totally changed my life. And we are offering this book on the power of imagination for a donation of any amount. We'll have a lot of people that will send in nothing or very little, and uh, we'll give out fifty to 70,000 of these. And so we need you to give if you can, but we want you to have this. And if for some reason you wouldn't give anything, I've got a little brief uh, summary of this entitled, Believing is Seeing. It's the opposite of what the saying is that so many people use about seeing is believing, but this talks about how you have to see things on the inside. This is an introduction to this teaching on the power of imagination. And as I said, this has just totally revolutionized my life. You know, I've used my imagination. Each one of us do. There's many people that when you're talking about imagination, you only think of fantasy. You think about a, you know, a talking mouse or a flying elephant or something like that. And that's what a lot of people think of when you think of imagination. But the definition of imagination is just literally, according to the dictionary, your ability to see something on the inside that is not real or present with you at that moment. And whether you recognize it or not, you use your imagination constantly. You can't live without an imagination. You can't remember anything without an imagination. You know, this last weekend I was studying the Word in Hebrews chapter 11 about faith being the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And that just got me to thinking about all of this. And I spent quite a bit of time just going back and remembering things that God has done in my life. And I found myself as I was remembering the, the things that, uh, the memories that had the greatest impact on me, I could picture it. I could see exactly when that was. I remember exactly when I proposed to Jamie. I could tell you exactly where I was. I, and it's just like I see it. And did you know that this is how you remember? Let me turn over to, to a passage of Scripture in um, 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 18. I'll have to read this because I'm not sure I'd quote it. But uh, David had just made a huge offering to the building of the temple. It was at the end of his life. He had already put Solomon, his son, in as the king. And then he brought this huge amount of money that if you were to get my living commentary, I've got all of this uh, converted into U.S. dollars and what the equivalency of all of this is. But it was, it was billions of dollars that David gave in gold and silver and precious stones to his son to help build the temple. And then the people got so blessed to see what their king had done and how he offered and gave to the building of this temple that they wound up giving an offering that equaled what he did. So altogether, it was the equivalent of around a four or five billion dollars worth of offering that came in in one day. And that's what's being reported in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And David was just so touched by this that he just began to pray in front of all of the people. And he basically was saying, God, this is, this is you. We were slaves in Egypt. We had nothing. And now to see where this kingdom had come in such a short period of time and to think that we could give like this, give billions of dollars worth of gold and silver and precious stones to the building of the temple. He says, it's just because of your blessing on our life. We were nothing before. Everything that we've done is just take a portion of what you've given us and we've given it back to you. And so he was blessing the people. And I don't know if any of you have ever been in a church service where the spirit of giving just broke out. I have. I've seen people give their homes, give their cars, uh, come up and uh, just take off their wedding rings. And I mean, the I don't know how to describe that, but when you see some people give like that. It just inspires other people. I remember one service where there was a man 
who got up and he was crying so emotionally that you could barely understand what he was saying. But he said he just didn't have anything to give. He was very poor, but he was, he was just going to play something for him. And then he got to cry and he says, but I have never played a piano in my life. And he got over there and just started with one finger hitting these keys. And it was embarrassing in a way because he could not play. He would hit in between keys and two keys would play at one time. It was terrible. But to see the way that this guy had nothing to get, he was giving what he could. It touched people. I mean, people started running to the front and they started giving all kinds of things. This is when I saw people give away their cars. They would give their car keys away. They uh, came and pledged that they were going to sell their house and put the money into the church. And anyway, when something like that happens, it makes an impression on you. And this is what David was talking about here. And here's what he said in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 18. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people and prepare their heart unto thee. You know, if you really stop and think about this, what he's asking is, God, don't let us ever forget this. Keep this ingrained, like burn this on our hearts that we will never forget the way that people were touched by God and just begin to give so liberally to the building of the temple. So another way of saying this is that, you know, you can't remember without your imagination. He says, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart. In other words, help them to remember. You remember by using your imagination. You know, many people didn't grow up in just one place. You might have moved around. And so because of that, you don't have just a, you know, a memory of one place that you grew up. But I grew up in one house ever since I was two years old. Uh, I grew up in the same place. And so if you were to ask me about that house, I guarantee you I can describe that to you. And yet I'm not looking at it. It's not like I can see it with my physical eyes, but I've got that burnt in my memory. That's your imagination. I can show you that house. I could tell you everything about that house. And it's not only limited to that, but you know, just anything. If you want to remember where your car is parked, did you know that you use your imagination? If you come out of a mall, you may not remember like an exact spot that it's parked, but you remember that when you come out of the mall, you got to go to the right or to the left. You're on the front row. You're on the back row. You have some type of a picture of this. You know, if I was to ask you about how many windows do you have in your bedroom, uh, most of you have not ever counted those, but you could count them. You, you could count the number of doors in your house. Let's say the outside doors. How many outside doors? do you have in your house? Did you know you can't see that? And most of you haven't sat down and calculated this, but you could tell me because you can see it. That's your imagination. And you have an imagination. You can't function without one. If you, you couldn't get home if you didn't have an imagination. Your imagination is your ability to remember and you remember what it looks like. If I was to ask you, how do you get from where you are to the airport or to, you know, some eating place or something like that. And if you'd been there before, you know, you could tell me, you could say you go down here to the second or you'd, you'd count and say, no, it's the third light. And then you turn right or left and you could tell me what's on the corner. You can't see that with your physical eyes, but you can see it in your heart. So I'm just saying all of these things to say that when some people, when I talk about imagination, they think that's childish. I'm, I'm dealing in reality. I'm not going to sit here and imagine something. Well, I'm not talking about fantasy. I'm talking about your ability to see something with your heart. You can't remember. You can't think. You can't function without an imagination. So there is a positive use of the imagination. Matter of fact, I've got this little booklet and I've got some things defined here. Um, the word vision here from uh, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. The word vision, according to the American Heritage Dictionary, means a mental image produced by the imagination. So you could say that where there is no imagination, the people perish, 
Or here's the way that the Amplified Bible translates that verse. It says, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. You know, the King James says the people perish. The Amplified says they're unrestrained. If you look up in the Darby Bible and also the English Standard Bible, the scripture says there, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. Do you know, all of these things are basically saying the same thing. If you don't have a purpose, a vision, if you don't see someplace, uh, if like for instance, for instance, if you were trying to get from, uh, say, from New York to California, did you know that if you have a certain destination, then you ha that limits your choices? Or let me use another, you know, if you leave New York, you've got to basically... Uh, go west because you go east and you run into the ocean. So let's use another example. Let's say that you're in the middle of the country in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and you wanted to go from Tulsa to Los Angeles. Did you know that for you to get there, you have to have a vision, a destination in mind? And what that does, it limits your choices because you could, you could take off from Tulsa and head east, but I can guarantee you, you'll never get to Los Angeles heading east from Tulsa, Oklahoma. You've got to go west and not only west, but you would have to go a little bit south and you, it would limit your choices. And this is what this is talking about, where there is no vision. If you don't know where you're going, well, then any old road will get you there. And so you could just head in any direction. And did you know, sad to say, this is descriptive of the vast majority of people. They don't have a vision. They don't see them accomplishing something specific. They are more like water that just takes the path of least resistance. They always flow to the lowest level. I know that that may not bless you and that may agitate some people to hear that, but you need to hear it because you're the only one that can change the direction of your life. If you're waiting on God to just sovereignly move you like a chess piece and you think that it, everything just automatically works out, you're never going to arrive at any place. Everything that I see in the Word of God, everything in my life that God has done, you have to have a vision and pursue it. Like when it comes to being born again, did you know people don't get just born again automatically? It's God's will for every single person to be saved. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So that's as clear as you can make it. It is God's will for every person to be saved, but it doesn't automatically come to pass because Jesus said that there would be more than enter in by the broad gate unto destruction than by the narrow gate unto everlasting life. So even though it's God's will for every single person to be saved, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's will. But it doesn't automatically come to pass. You have to pursue it. You have to get a vision. You may not use this terminology, but you have to see that it's God's will for you to be saved. You have to see that Jesus died for your sins and provided healing, and you have to pursue it. You have to reach out and take it. If you don't take it, salvation doesn't just come upon you. It doesn't just fall upon you. You have to pursue it. Any of you who are born again would have to agree with what I'm saying. There was a time that you were just living your own life, but then God arrested you somehow or another, showed you that the way you were going was leading to destruction, and he turned you. He revealed himself to you, but he didn't force you to get saved. You had to reach out and take it. And so you had to appropriate what God had done. Did you know that even after you're born again, it's the same thing with vision. God doesn't just automatically move your life, sovereignly put you into the right place. Now, I'm speaking to people all over the world. We have a potential of over 5 billion people that can watch this program. And I can guarantee you out of that number of people, there are millions and millions of people that functionally are operating contrary to what the Word of God says. You are just thinking that God somehow or another sovereignly moves in your life and things are going to happen and uh, that God just, you know, causes things to happen in your life without your choice. That is not so. That is not at what the Word of God teaches. And the Scripture says in Mark chapter 7, verse 13, that the traditions and doctrines of men make the Word of God of none effect. 
And I guarantee you, if you've been brought up with that kind of logic, it'll just, it, it'll destroy you. Or like these verses say in the Amplified, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. Or these two other versions, the Darby and the English Standard, the people cast off restraint. In other words, if you think that God is just going to sovereignly make everything work in your life, well then, case Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. And you just live your life and do whatever, and you blame God for all of the results. You don't ha put any restraint in your life. But if you understand that God has a purpose, a God-given purpose for your life, and, and you can see that goal, that's what vision is, is the ability to see something with your heart that you can't see with your eyes. And so you can see into the future. You can see what God wants your life to be. When you get that vision, that limits your choices. You can't just, if you're in Tulsa wanting to go to LA, you can't go east. You got to go west. You got to go a little bit south. It's going to limit your choices. You'll have to choose the roads that you want if you want to arrive at a certain destination. But people that don't have a vision for their life, they just cast off restraint. There is no restrictions on their life. They just are like a pinball that you just launch it and it just bounces off of things. Boy, that is so descriptive of so many people that I meet that they don't have a direction for their life. Again, going back to my personal life, I knew from a very young age that God had a purpose for me. Or let me say it this way. I believed that God had a purpose for me. I had no clue what it was. I remember when I was five, six, seven years old, I used to lay out in the backyard at our house in Arlington, Texas, and just look up at the sky. And I would spend hours out there just asking God, what is my purpose? And trying to figure things out. Now, I didn't have very much understanding then, but I had the desire. And then, of course, uh, you know, you get into school and basically in the U.S., our education is planned out for the first 12 grades and you, you know, until you're 18 years old and graduate from high school, you don't have to really make any decisions. So even though I believe that God had a purpose for my life, I just got sidetracked just, you know, going through school and doing the normal things. But as I approached graduating from high school, they brought in counselors and these counselors begin to talk about, you know, you're going to graduate from school. You got to make a decision. Are you going to college? If you go to college, what are you going to major in? What are your plans for your life? And so this activated this again. And I remember my senior year in high school, I got up and threw a paper route every morning, 440 papers every single morning. So I had to get up at like four something in the morning. And yet I would stay up until one or two every night just reading the Bible. I figured that somewhere in the Bible had to be my answer. I had asked my pastors, I'd asked other people, how do you know God's will for your life? And they didn't have a clue. They couldn't tell me. It was, it was kind of similar to like, you know, people say about how do you know who you're supposed to marry? And they just say, well, you'll just hear bells and whistles. There'll be this chemistry. Nobody could tell you. That's not what the Word of God says, by the way. But anyway, I couldn't get an answer from people, and so I just started reading the Bible. I mean, I read the entire Bible my senior year in high school. I read multiple commentaries and, and read all of their comments about the Bible. And then after I graduated, I went into college. I just was taking the uh, required courses to get them out of the way, and I was a math major because that was my best subject when I was in school. And, but I didn't know what I was going to do. And then during my Christmas break, my first semester in college, it was 1967. Uh, I ran across a scripture that said in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that last phrase in that second verse where it says you will prove, the word prove means to make manifest to your physical senses what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When I saw that, that's the first scripture 
that ever just became a revelation to me. I mean, it went off on the inside of me like a bomb. And this is what I'd been seeking my whole life up to that point was, God, how do I know what your will for my life is? And it said right here, you do these things and you will prove, make manifest to your physical senses the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And so when I saw that, that was over the Christmas break, 1967. And from then until March the 23rd, 1968, that's just about all I did was study Romans 12, 1 and 2. And I was praying and asking God, what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? What does this mean? What does it mean that it's only our reasonable service? I thought that was just for the super saints, the ones that were going to be, you know, somehow or another a pastor of a church or something. And what does it mean not to be conformed to this world? What does it mean to renew your mind? I just was pouring over these things and praying about it. And all of that softened my heart and prepared me. And on March the 23rd, 1968, God showed up in one of my prayer meetings that I was in on a Saturday night. I was with my friends. And I mean, God showed up. And it's a long story. Matter of fact, I've got a little booklet entitled My Appointment with God that would really summarize what I've been saying here today. And I'll make that booklet available to you as a gift. If you will call or write and ask for it, we'll just give it to you. But it's about a, I think it's a 30-page booklet that just summarizes that and talks about what happened. And I guarantee you, it revolutionized my life. So I've said all of those things to say that, see, my whole life I've known that there was something that God had for me. It was very vague. And until I had this experience with the Lord, I didn't know for sure what it was going to be. But boy, when I encountered God, I mean, from that moment on, I didn't know the details, but I knew I was going to spend the rest of my life trying to glorify God, trying to reveal who God was, what I had seen and what I'd experienced. I wanted other people to know that. And see, that gave me a destination and that limited my choices. It, it made me restrain myself. And I started making choices that uh, in the natural could have been uh, very destructive, but I felt it's like what God wanted me to do. And because of it, where I am today, I would have had to have backslid on God. I would have had to turn and rebelled at God to keep from being where I am today because of these things that I've been talking about. And it all involves imagination, seeing something, having a vision on the inside. I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel and the programs that we have available. And I want to encourage you that you can get the materials that we've offered. Also, I'd like to encourage you to like our program and subscribe to what we're doing. We have a lot of material and I believe it'll be a real blessing to you. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you.